I'm Andrew with AGL Mechanical Tips, and today I'm going to teach you the first thing you should know before working on a geothermal system and why it is bad to hook this set of refrigerant gauges up to this system. In this video, I'm going to show you how to calculate heat of extraction, heat of rejection, and this is a formula, put it right here that is used to calculate the performance of this system. Any maintenance tech who's wanting to maintain geothermal systems, this is the first thing that you should learn. And by using this formula, you might find that most of the time it's not necessary to hook your gauges up to the system. Every time you hook a set of gauges up to the system, um, you're losing about three ounces of refrigerant to this hose right here. And there also may be contaminants or moisture in this hose. So, Unless it's really necessary, we try to avoid hooking these up. Um, we install geothermal equipment to last about 20 years. And if you're taking care of the system and you're having a maintenance done every six months, and that maintenance tech hooks his, hooks his gauges up every time he does a maintenance, in 20 years, he would have hooked his gauges up 40 times. So if we can eliminate the need to hook these gauges up, it's probably a good idea. Don't let this equation intimidate you. This is actually a very simple process. Once you do it a few times, it's gonna be very quick and it'll be a very fast way to know that this system's performing properly. There's two parts to this equation. One is the gallons per minute flowing through the systems. We, ha we have to calculate that. And then we have to calculate the temperature difference between the water going into the unit and coming out of the unit. To calculate the flow rate, we're gonna use a pressure gauge this is an analog pressure gauge. It needs to be a large dial because we need to be really accurate. Um, I actually don't use analog anymore. I'm using a Testo 549i. Um, this is actually used for checking refrigerant pressure, but we've put an adapter here to a needle to where we can check water pressure. The other part of the equation is the temperature difference between the water going in and water going out. So for this, you can use any kind of stick thermometer. Um, I've actually got a fluke meat thermometer here. It's, it's literally used for, um, for meat, um, but I've been using it for years for this and it works great. And it's just a type K. So it can go into a voltmeter that does temperature or it can go into an infrared gun like this to, to give you the temperature reading. Or you can even just use one of those stick thermometers, but I find that the shafts on those are a little bit thicker um, and they wear down the, the PT ports on the geo units a little bit more. The only other thing we need is a lubricant for, for this needle here. Um, these PT ports right here, inside of them they have a rubber donut. And it's not good to lubricate this with a petroleum product like Vaseline or something. We recommend a water-based lubricant. Um, you can get this from a pharmacy or an online retailer. I've got my system up and running here and we're about to start collecting some data from it. But before I do that, um, I want to explain what, what we're actually calculating here. Um, and if you watched my video on the basics of geothermal, you learn that a simple air conditioner, all it does is grab heat from somewhere and move it somewhere else. In the case of a geothermal system, we're grabbing heat from the air in the house and we're moving it into this water and it is then going outside into the earth to be rejected if we're cooling. So when we are in the cooling cycle, we are calculating how much heat is being rejected into the earth. By knowing how much heat we're re rejecting into the earth, we essentially know how much, how much um, heat we have removed from inside and are then, then we know our performance. Um, so calculating um, heat of rejection is the cooling cycle and calculating heat of extraction would be the heating cycle because in the heating cycle, we're actually extracting heat from the earth and we're putting it into the house. Now, both of these methods are almost exactly the same. So if you calculate one, you basically do the same thing to calculate the other. I just simply wanted you to know what the difference between heat of extraction is and what heat of rejection is. So heat of rejection, we are rejecting heat into the earth, which would be cooling because we're grabbing heat from the house, rejecting it into the, into the earth. And in the heating um, cycle, we are extracting heat from the earth and carrying it inside. So step one is ready in our unit for this test to be performed. And we're wanting to calculate heat of rejection. So we're gonna put this in the cooling mode because this system is gonna be rejecting heat. 
Now, I want to mention, this is a 7 Series unit. It's a lot more advanced um, than some of the other units. I'm using this to train on, and this unit actually gives me the heat of extraction, heat of rejection in real time. I know that it does. Um, I'm just simply using this to train on. But if this was a simple geothermal system, you'd be using these PT ports. Um, and you would start by putting this into the cooling cycle and you'd want the blower speed all the way up. So high blower, high compressor speed in cooling. All right, step two is our data collection. Um, we have our unit in cool mode. It's on a high compressor. And this is gonna be four parts here. We're gonna take our temperature in, our temperature out, then we're gonna take our pressure in and our pressure out. So to get my temperature in, I'm gonna start with a stick thermometer. Um, this is a type K meat thermometer. You can use a digital stick thermometer, but you cannot use an analog stick thermometer. The, the, the gauge is just too small. It's just not accurate enough. Um, I guess in a pinch you might be able to, but it's, it's, it's not advised. So I'm gonna start by lubricating this with a water-based lubricant. Um, petroleum is, is bad, it'll eat up the, the rubber in this, uh, the O-ring in here. Um, so make sure you're using a water-based lubricant. Simply take the cap off this um, PT port here and insert the probe. I'm gonna give that thermometer just a couple seconds to acclimate. And I'm gonna check my temperature and um, it's pretty steady at 77 degrees. So my temperature in is 77 degrees. And now I'm just gonna remove that and do the same thing on my, um, on my source out right here. So I'm gonna re-lubricate it. Another reason I really like this, it has, a good, it has a good sharp tip to it. So the first time these are being used, it's pretty smooth. But I'm just gonna insert that again. I'm gonna give that a second to acclimate. And I'm getting 90 degrees out. So to get our pressure in and pressure out, the most cost effective way is to get a big um, analog gauge like this. Um, I don't recommend using a smaller one like this. Again, again, accuracy is very important here. Um, these are only gonna be a few PSI off. And if we're off one PSI on this gauge, it's gonna affect our flow rate. It's gonna be inaccurate. Um, I've even gone a step further. I don't use analog no more. I'm actually using this, this Testo gauge here. Um, it reports pressure to my phone. Um, it's very accurate. This is what I'm gonna use on this video. Um, just like with the um, temperature probe, we're gonna lubricate this with a water-based lubricant. Um, this is actually a much smaller needle, so it's a lot easier and not as invasive on the port itself. I'm going to go ahead and thread this on. So that is now reporting to my phone here. And I'm reporting 28.9 PSI. That 0.9 is actually important. I, I'm close enough, but I'm going to go ahead and do 28.9. Just like before, I'm going to take this back off. I'm going to re-lubricate it. And I'm going to get my source out pressure. And this is reporting 27.5 PSI. So I'm going to write that down. I am then going to remove my pressure gauge. I'm going to seal these ports back up. And these are like a, a second defense for leakage, so it's good that you tighten these up good. And I'm just going to wipe down this unit, get this water that I sprayed off of it. And that's it for step two. Now that we have all of our data from step two, we're gonna move on to step three. And step three is what I'm calling it, is organizing that data to input into, your, into our equation here. So to start, we wanna figure out the GPM, which is gallons per minute, which is our flow rate. We need to find out the gallons per minute here. We do that using our pressure in and our pressure out. 
it is actually the, the pressure drop that we're trying to find out here. So it's the difference between the two that are, we actually need here. So we're going to take 28.9 and subtract 27.5 from that. And we're left with 1.4. So 1.4 is our pressure drop. I have a table here that was published by Water Furnace. It's page 50 of their installation manual. Um, any other manufacturer should have a table that is um, very similar. And what it is, is, it's testing that they've done on the heat exchanger inside this unit. And they've cal calculated what the pressure drop is for each flow rate. So using this table, I'm able to basically line up my roundabout temperature to get me on the right column. And then I go down that table and find the corresponding pressure for this specific system. And it gives me my gallon per minute flow rate. So in this case, my temperature in temperature out was um, 77 and 90. I'm going to use the 90 degrees on this table and then I'm going to follow this table down to where it says 1.4 and then I'm going to follow that over and it gives me a flow rate of 7.5 GPM. I'm going to write that down. One thing to mention is this table is also showing three separate model units here. This is a four ton unit, so it is their 048 model. Um, so just when you're using the table, make sure you're on the right system. Another part of organizing our data here is um, this equation is GPM times 500, which I'll go over in a little bit, times the delta T. The delta T is the difference between the temperature going in and the temperature going out. So all we're gonna do is simply subtract 77 from our 90, and that leaves us with 13 degrees. That is our delta T. We now have our, all of our data prepared for this equation. So step four is gonna actually be completing the equation. I wanted to explain one more part though. We have this value here that is 500. This value is what represents water as part of the equation. If you're using glycol or antifreeze, it would be 485 instead. The reason being is, is glycol or antifreeze is just a little bit less conductive, a little bit less efficient, so we have to use a different value for that. So I'm going to take that out and we're just going to calculate it. I'm going to write 7.5, which is my GPM right here, times 500 times my delta T right here, which is 13. And what that gives me is 48,750. So this right here is my heat of rejection value. Now, how is that helpful to us? Well, this unit is a four ton unit um, and one ton is 12,000 BTU. So this is actually a 48,000 BTU unit. We just use ton to explain it easily, but we have a 48,000 BTU unit here. So if you're doing a maintenance on a system, there, there's two ways of analyzing this data. You can go to the manufacturer's performance data sheet and get very accurate results on how this should be performing. Um, but rule of thumb is you need to be plus or minus 10% of the published data for the unit to be um, known as operating correctly. Um, in this case, I know when I go to that table, it's going to be near 48,000 BTUs because it's a 48,000 BTU unit. So in this case, during a maintenance, I probably wouldn't pull out the performance data sheet and confirm it. But if it was a startup and I'm trying to optimize the performance of this system, I absolutely would go to the performance data sheet and try to fine tune some of this. And if it was off, I'd try to figure out why and you know maybe increase my water flow rate or something like that. But this is enough information to tell me that I don't need to hook refrigerant gauges onto this system. So every time I do a maintenance, unless this is this value is way off, like if this was 40,000 BTUs or something, I'd say, wait, we've got an issue here. I'd make sure that I don't have a, a water flow issue or um, an airflow issue or something like that. And, and if I was still getting a bad reading, I would then hook my gauges up to the system. So real quick, I can show you how to get these values on a performance data sheet. Um, and you basically find the temperature that your water is around. Um, and you line that up with your heat of extraction column 
and your gallon per minute flow rate. These columns normally don't give you the exact values. For instance, I'm running 7.5 GPM, but I'm in the 8.0 column. That's just the closest value. And when I line up those two columns, I end up with 48,000 BTUs. My unit's running 48,750, so I'm right where I need to be. Just to do a quick recap, step one, we prepared our unit for data collection. So we put this system in cooling, we put our blower speed up. If we were doing heating, we would put it into heating. Our blower setting is not as critical. So medium fan setting is okay for that. Um, but we prepare our unit for our data collection. And then in step two, we took our temperature in, our temperature out, our pressure in, and our pressure out. Step three, using our pressure drop table, we calculated our GPM flow rate. And then we also figured out the delta T by subtracting the temperature in from the temperature out. In step four, we plugged that data into our calculation, which gave us the heat of extraction, heat of rejection for this unit. In step five, we compared that data with the performance data for this unit. The only other thing I wanted to go over is where you actually get the data from on this equipment. Um, this specific unit, I pulled the pressure drop table from the installation manual. This is what I use to calculate the GPM flow rate. And then the performance data actually came from the Water Furnace 7 Series specification catalog. If you learned something today, hit the like and subscribe button. I've got much more geothermal content coming out. I'm Andrew with AGL Mechanical Tips, and remember, quality is your reputation.